thanks so much uh, for joining us to talk about this extraordinarily important matter for the future of our democracy. It's, a, it's about maintaining the access to vote. And I'm here uh, with Joaquin Castro, who uh, one of the nice things about being in Congress, I get to hang out with people like Joaquin. I do. And uh, he's told me a secret. I'm not giving much away, but he'd like to come to Vermont sometime. So this is about as close it's as true. you're going to get for a it's while. True. I've heard good things about Vermont. I want to visit at some point. All true. And uh, Joaquin and I serve on the Intelligence Committee. We sit next to each other. And we went through the whole uh, Russia investigation. Uh, we went through that, uh, uh, that entire investigation about uh, President Trump's call uh, to the president of Ukraine. Uh, so we've been uh, battled hard. Oh, yeah. It was been a very intense uh, few years on the Intel Committee. Yeah. And you're, my, you're, you're senior to me on the Intel Committee. That's right. I think I mean by a term. Yeah. I, I right. you by a term. Yeah. Uh, but this question of voting is what Joaquin and I both want to talk about. And let me just put it in perspective uh, for a few minutes, and then I'm going to turn it over to Joaquin, and then we really uh, are eager to engage with you and answer questions. You know, all of us uh, were just astonished and appalled at what happened on January 6th. Uh, and Joaquin and I were both uh, present when that happened. And of course, what was so astonishing about that is that it was a real, uh, for the first time, uh, an organized effort uh, to try to stop the peaceful transfer of power. Uh, and that's the linchpin of our democracy. Uh, you have an election and the people who vote decide who the leader is. You don't turn that over to the influence of the mob or, as they were requesting, have members of Congress uh, not certify the person who was elected by the people. That was one. In number two, what was so significant, violence was used uh, in an effort to get a political, out a political outcome. And we have, to ex we have to respect the peaceful transfer of power and we have to renounce violence. Now, we did our job and certified the election of Joe Biden. But what's happening now in so many states uh, is that in state legislatures, what the mob was unable to accomplish uh, by decertifying that election, legislatures are trying to accomplish by the use of new laws that would give the force of law to denying access or making it very difficult for people to have access to vote. And there's really, uh, in, we're seeing uh, several states have passed laws already that are quite restrictive. We're gonna hear from Joaquin about Texas. And it's a real threat to our democracy because even in this last election, President Biden won by 7 million votes. That was his margin. But if 42,000 votes were switched in three states, Wisconsin, Arizona, uh, and Georgia, then we would have a President Trump, not a President Biden. And I say that because if we start having limited access for folks in those states and other states to vote, it doesn't take much to flip what is the popular vote and the will of the people as expressed in each state vote. Now, we're fortunate in Vermont where our legislature did a great job, our governor, Democratic legislature, Republican governor, and of course, we're really grateful to Jim Pounders, our Secretary of State who has been doing everything possible to make it as easy as possible to vote. And that's a bipartisan commitment we've had in Vermont. And of course, in the last election, uh, we had the highest voter turnout ever, 387,000. Oh, wow. That's yeah. in our state, but our state is one district. It's, we're a little smaller than Texas. <laughs> Just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> but we're as proud as you are in Texas. But you know, obviously, Joaquin and I are both committed to a, really an open, I'd say the last style approach. Everybody who is legally entitled to vote, we want to make it as easy as possible for that person to vote. That's not the way it is in many of our state legislatures. That's not the way it is with many of our colleagues here in Congress who are fighting us tooth and nail uh, against the provisions in what's called HR1. We passed that in the House, but it's all about making voting accessible. It's also about ethics. It's about taking dirty money out of out of politics. That's now uh, in the U.S. Senate. Uh, and it's, of course, a subject to the question of whether it can be considered uh, unless there's filibuster reform. Uh, but essentially, we've got a struggle here that I see as core 
to maintaining the principle that has guided our democracy since its founding, and that is the people decide, not the politicians, and that elections should be decided by the vote, but also by the battle of ideas, not by a legislature or a political party that can make it tough for people who oppose them. It's got to be about the battle of ideas. So, Joaquin, you, I just want to mention the folks, too. We've got a lot of Texas legislators here. That's right. We can talk about that. But you were in the state house. Um, ten years. I was there for ten years, and uh, you're right, Peter. At, at the events of January six were just tragic for the country, and thankfully, the election was certified later that night by the Congress, and Joe Biden uh, took office on January twentieth, as he should have. Uh, but th there's still like, lingering, um, just harmful effects from that. Even today, the announcement uh, that Kevin McCarthy was going to pull all of the Republicans from the January 6th commission uh, because Speaker Pelosi objected to two of them who have been some of the folks that have engaged in denial of the insurrection, conspiracy theories about what happened, voted against the certification. But in reaction to the results of the 2020 election, you had some states like Texas, a Republican legislature in Texas, and the governor who have tried to make it even harder for people to go vote. And, and bear in mind that Texas doesn't have the same accessible voting laws that Vermont has. Uh, in right. fact, Texas has some of the most restrictive voting laws already. And the Republican legislature there is trying to make it even harder for folks to vote. And so uh, more than 50 Democrats broke quorum. Uh, uh, Why don't you explain that? What it means? Yeah. To and so, well, under the Texas Constitution, there's 150 state representatives in the, in the Texas legislature. You need 100 to have a quorum to conduct legislative business. So, uh, you know, 60 or so left the state and came to Washington, D.C. to prevent that quorum and prevent the Republican legislature from uh, basically passing a horrendous voter suppression bill. Uh, for example, I say horrendous because they would yeah. do things like allow for, for poll watchers to be watching you as you vote. But the poll watchers were party affiliated, right? Yeah, That's they could be. Anyway. Wait, literally, you could have the Proud Boys and others go stand there as poll watchers uh, in uh, black and brown communities, uh, really anywhere, and watch people as they vote. And, you know, and so it's that kind of ta tactics of intimidation to try to keep people from voting, uh, you know, but it would do other things as well. It would add criminal penalties uh, if they find that, um, you know, they, they added all these laws about restrictions on how you can help uh, even family members assist them and go vote, right? So they're doing all of these things that amount to a kind of a point shaving effort, right? right? And that's what voter ID was, really. It was a point shaving effort. 95% of people may have an ID, but these folks understand that in that 5% that shows up without one, uh, and in the laws that they're trying to pass now, that in that percentage of people, that's how you can keep winning close elections and prevent a state from really uh, flipping politically. And that's what's been going on in Texas. And actually, yeah, in Texas, because uh, Biden lost only by six. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So that, that is getting tighter. It is. It's a state that, you know, it used to be solidly Democratic. It was considered part of the Democratic South. But for a generation now, it has been a solidly Republican state. Uh, George W. Bush in the 1990s, you know, that started the real transition in earnest. But in the last few elections since about 2018, so the 2018-2020 elections, uh, have been a lot closer. And, you know, there, there's a feeling that there's a lot of momentum that the state, you know, you can't say it's blue yet because Democrats aren't winning elections, but that it's a purple state and the elections are getting more competitive. So these voter, voter suppression efforts, uh, and, and then we haven't even talked about the, the, or the gerrymandering that goes on in these congressional well, districts you know, in that's, Texas. That's the point. I want to come back to that because there's really uh, three things that are uh, threatening to the people making the decision. You know, one are these restrictive measures that are attempting right. to stop or make it really tough for the people to vote. Uh, number two is gerrymandering. And that's a real challenge for us because uh, many of the uh, legislatures are Republican controlled and it, 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 the folks in them have taken many of them, the majority of them have taken a pledge basically uh, that an article of faith for re-election is that the election was stolen. 
uh, from President Trump. And in fact, I was yeah. seeing, I think, a report that of the 700 or so Republicans who have announced their candidacies for Congress, uh, well over 60% have made it the major issue uh, that the election was rigged. Well, you're right. And I saw, I think a statistic today, I was reading an article that said that something like 55% of Trump voters believe that this insurrection uh, that happened on January 6th was uh, was justified, basically, right? right? They, 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 they thought that it was a fair thing, uh, which is amazing to think about. Yeah, so it's a, it's, it's, it's more important. It's it's really existential. You know, one of the things, be interested in your reaction on this, but, you know, as, as alarming as you know, January 6th was, and we were in the building, and it was violent, and uh, people were killed. Uh, in fact, that... Uh, person who was the mob trying to break into the house floor, uh, the woman who was shot in the process of doing that with others, uh, that was 20 feet below where I was. I was in the floor right above, and I don't know where you were. Yeah, no, I was in my office most yeah. of the day, you know, and, and um, but just the scene there of a mob of people storming the Capitol and breaking into the house chamber, same thing, trampling over the Senate, uh, was amazing to think about how close we were to the election on that day, not getting certified, right. That's right. Uh, and these people being successful in what they were attempting to do. And the, the, the point I wanted to make is this, that that was appalling and shocking to everyone. Uh, the videos that you saw of the mob coming into the Capitol, what they were doing to Capitol Police. And that I think caused a reaction. It was you know too much violence and people recoiled from it. But what's happening now in state legislatures that's quiet uh, and that is being done with the force of law behind it. And of course, we have a Supreme Court uh, that has turned, it's taken a radical right turn in reviewing uh, uh, the, the election laws yeah, from the perspective absolutely. of yeah, stopping people. If we get these, if these laws get passed and they don't, uh, have the benefit of the federal legislation that Joaquin and I are, have supported and voted for, but has to get through the Senate, then the voter suppression has the force of law and it doesn't it exhibit itself uh, in the way that the violent attack on the Capitol did, where people back off and say, hey, that's not right. So uh, that's one of the things that really concerns me. And of course, you're really at the heart of that in Texas. Yeah, you're right. I mean, look, the danger is that when you've got uh, these Republican majorities in so-called red states that are going to use their majorities and try to trample on people's rights to vote, uh, going to try to gerrymander the heck out of these districts. My district looks like a butterfly, literally. There is a district, Lloyd Doggett's district, our colleague from Texas, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, comes down in this weird uh, shape. There's another chicken finger shaped district in Texas. So severe gerrymandering in addition to this voter suppression that's going on, uh, that is really, you know, it, it has thoroughly infected our democracy. Right. And then the, ho the hostile Supreme Court. Right. You know, the John Lewis. Uh, Let me see if I can put our light back on okay. so people can see us. Okay. Maybe not. Oh, sorry. Oh, no worries. Yeah, little technical, uh, little <laughs> challenge there. But the uh, the the Supreme Court changed what was the landmark legislation uh, in of, of the voting rights law in 1965, and we passed legislation to reverse it. What that law had done was say that in many of these districts where there had been a history of discrimination before the local officials uh, could change the law. Uh, because in the past, when they changed the law, it was always to restrict access to voting, particularly for black and brown people. There had to be pre-clearance and approval, essentially, from the Civil Rights Division uh, in the Justice Department. And the Civil Rights Division has generally been staffed by people who have committed their lives and their careers uh, to the protection of civil rights. And the Supreme Court basically said, uh, we don't need that anymore. Uh, and in my view, it's a terrible decision, and we've got to uh, change that. And that's part of, uh, of, that's of right. the legislation that we want to, uh, we got through the House and we want to get through the Senate. Uh, 
before we open up to questions, maybe, uh, Joaquin, you can uh, say some of the things you think are the most important provisions in the uh, uh, in uh, HR1. Yeah, well, you know, let's start with a few. When you think about HR1 and HR4, uh, as you mentioned, making sure that we restore the Voting Rights Act so that states can't just change these election laws or add voter suppression laws to the books in their states. Um, you know, without running it by the federal government and making sure that people's rights are protected to vote, uh, but also doing things like um, creating more transparency for super PACs, uh, making sure that there is a redistricting commission that's an independent and bipartisan commission. So as you mentioned earlier, right now what you have is politicians drawing their own districts. Right. And, and I said that- For the benefit of the politicians. That's right. The voters. Yeah, right. absolutely. And I don't think if you're Republican or Democrat, that you ought to be drawing your own political district. I think we need to move past that in American politics. Uh, so it would make more dark money more transparent. You know, it would do things like make sure that we have uh, fair redistricting, which is incredibly important. Um, mm -hmm. And so this legislation is gonna be key uh, to combating the things that we're seeing going on in places like Texas and Georgia and Arizona and so many other places. And, you know, in Texas, it has been bad for a long time. Um, in 2011, when the Texas legislature passed its latest round of maps, for example, a federal court found that the Texas legislature intentionally, not accidentally or negligently, but intentionally discriminated against minority voters in how it drew its maps, that there was intentional discrimination. Intentional. Oh yeah, and so that's what we're dealing with in a place like Texas. And um, so there's a lot at stake for yeah. us and for people in many other states. You know, I, I really uh, think it's important for us in Vermont to appreciate that. You know, as you heard in my opening remarks, we're very fortunate because we've had a long tradition, bipartisan, uh, of really encouraging, making it easy for folks to vote. And that's how it should be, by the way. Right. You know, I give kudos to the folks in Vermont who have, who have created that system. But if you can't vote fairly in Texas and you get vote suppressed, that's going to affect us in Vermont. Absolutely. Well, it affects the outcome of the yeah. composition of Congress and it affects right. the presidential election. So, uh, you know, we want to do everything we can. And uh, before we sign off tonight, I'm going to, uh, and Joaquin, we're going to give uh, folks some suggestions on things that you can do. Um, you know, I think we're at a point where if, uh, folks want to uh, ask some questions, we're glad to, we're glad to take them. Natalie uh, from my office is uh, handling the questions and uh, I think you can type them in uh, and uh, she'll field them and, uh, and Barkeen and I will do our best to address uh, your questions and hear, hear your comments. I'll give you the hard ones, Peter. <laughs> All right. Stanford, Stanford <laughs> College and Harvard Law. I think, I think we know who can take the hard ones. And I have a good friend that went to Middlebury too. So really? <laughs> Uh, all right, I will start to read out some of the questions. I'm Natalie from Team Welch. So for folks who just joined a little while ago, please keep submitting your questions and uh, we will try and get to them all. We're getting a lot of questions about the filibuster. And so uh, this first one is really for both of you. Um, is there anything you in the house can do? This is from Anita. Is there anything you can do in the house uh, to influence democratic colleagues in the Senate already eliminating the filibuster? This is no longer a Democratic against Republican issue. This is a dem democracy issue. Uh, so I'll let you guys take that one. <laughs> well, I think all of us, we, we can encourage our colleagues. You know, in Vermont, we've got uh, Bernie and Patrick, and I think both of them have given statements indicating that they're supportive of kind of ending what has been an incredible abuse of the filibuster. Uh, but as you know, it's going to come down to just a couple of senators who have to make that decision. Uh, we <sighs> hear about Joe Manchin a lot, and we hear about Kristen Sinema. Uh, but uh, all of us can talk to our colleagues, uh, but uh, you can write to those members too. Yeah, I mean, you know, as you were talking about your senators and how they're, they're both on board, obviously, to help on voting rights, but to waive the filibuster and specifically to waive the filibuster when it comes to people protecting people's voting rights and protecting our democracy. It made me think that I wish that politics was like sports. I wish that I could trade you, say, Ted Cruz for Bernie Sanders or, no or John Cornyn no way. Or, or Patrick Leahy, one of those. I know that I know that you would never accept those trades, but I'd still like to be able to do it. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, look, you know, in Texas, we're, we've got John Cornyn and Ted Cruz, uh, for two pretty hard right senators. Um, but we can both personally, wherever we're from, reach out to, the, to, to them and to their offices, make our case publicly, obviously, that there's so much at stake here. And again, you know, even if you don't, even if you don't make a, an exception in the filibuster for, for immigration, which has been a longstanding issue that people worked yeah. on for a long time, or for healthcare or for anything else, infrastructure, for example, there ought to be an exception for protecting people's voting rights. And by the way, Republicans made exceptions when it came to the Supreme Court nominees that they That's wanted right. to get on board. So it's not like, and the filibuster wasn't always the same number of votes uh, that you need now. Uh, and so uh, we should absolutely be willing to do it. Yeah, you know, Joaquin, one thing that I think it's worth talking about is why is it that our Republican colleagues here in D.C. are so dead set against uh, the For the People Act and their for uh, limiting access. And, you know, in D.C., it's totally different than talking to Vermont, Texas. Is, we've got a pretty conservative Republican Party. But, you know, the reality is down here, uh, if they, they fear the vote because uh, basically if you get the vote, then we're going to have a lot of policies that help working families and aren't so lenient and beneficial to corporations. And that's really what's been happening down here. Uh, and, and then you even saw when McConnell was uh, the majority leader, he used that reconciliation process to then run around the filibuster uh, to right. get those $2 trillion in tax cuts that went. Uh, that's absolutely basically, right. Basically yeah. to uh, the corporations. And, well, and the wealthiest yeah. people. I mean, literally the very wealthiest people in the country. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, so that is a challenge. It's, it's getting the senators ultimately to agree uh, to using or to waiving the filibuster uh, to allow HR1 and hopefully HR4 to actually pass. Mm -hmm. I've got another question for you both. Um, this is from... William, and he asks, uh, so many of the new restrictive laws seem to be written that they can only be challenged in the courts after their fact. Is there any way to challenge them prior to the next election? Well, and that's the importance of that pre-clearance requirement on a lot of this stuff. You know, that's why passing this federal legislation is so important uh, because it, it would require some of those proposals to be run by the federal government. Uh, and, you know, you think about, particularly in my part of the country, you know, Texas is interesting. Some folks consider it still part of the South. Some people consider it more Southwest. Uh, I think it's kind of a combination of both. But the history in the Southern United States in particular uh, and uh, the trampling of voting rights of African-Americans, of Mexican-Americans and others, uh, there's a long history there. And so we, you know, we need all the help that we can get in fighting back against that. Well, that's the point of the federal legislation. You know, under the Constitution, when it comes to federal office, it's the Congress that has the final say. Uh, now, elections could be administered locally, but when it comes to federal elections, the Congress has the right to establish standards. And our standards are basically access uh, for folks who are qualified to vote and not these restrictions that you're seeing uh, in Georgia and that uh, uh, Joaquin described in Texas. Uh, so this, this is like an existential question for our democracy. And it's about whether, as I said in the beginning, it's about whether people decide, but there's a lot at stake because the policies here, right now we're considering the, the, the COVID relief, uh, the child care tax credit, uh, that is going to lift half of the kids out of poverty who are in poverty. Uh, the, our ability to address climate change, which um, everybody knows, just look at what the weather is. All of these things that require governmental action. If we don't have a democracy where the mass, where everybody who can vote does vote, then we're not going to have a say in what those policies are. The energy companies will run rampant. The tax a burden will continue to increase on working families and will continue to be dis diminished on, on corporations and the very wealthy. So there's a lot at stake here. And you know, you asked a question earlier, there, there was a question about um, why Republicans in particular 
are not for something like HR1. And unfortunately, it's true that you've got very conservative Republicans in many states that, that now in a place like Texas, they're no longer trying to win elections by governing well or proposing new ideas. A, a big part of their strategy is to win elections by point shaving, by making it harder for the people who ordinarily vote against them to actually cast a ballot and vote against them. And this is a core piece of their strategy and HR1 and HR4 would combat that. On that point, we'd have, I have two, one question about HR4. Right. When is HR4 going to be coming to the floor? Uh, hopefully soon. Uh, we want to make sure. Remember, HR1 has passed the House, but HR4 has not passed the House. Uh, and we need to make sure that we get that done. The next question here is a, a kind of a combination of two questions, one from Marianne and then one from Patricia. And it's, if the Senate doesn't get to S1 this summer, would there be a way to counteract the gerrymandering created? Uh, these people know a lot about this. This is great. Created based on the new census data if the John Lewis Voting Rights Act does manage to get passed into law. Uh, yeah, I believe so. I believe that if we're able to get those things done uh, by the fall, I think that we have a shot. Remember, the legislatures of the country, in other words, the different state legislatures, are going to be passing their maps at different times. Uh, for example, in Texas, I believe we're supposed to get our our data in August, and then the Texas, the governor will call a special session after that so that the Texas legislature can draw these congressional maps. Um, you know, so it's my hope that, that at least by early fall, we can pass this stuff and give ourselves a shot at being able to block any of this egregious, horrible gerrymandering um, from happening again, because it's happened, it's happened repeatedly now, every decade. And I was part of a situation in Texas where uh, Republicans tried to do it twice in one decade because they didn't like the way the people of Texas voted in the congressional elections of 2002. And yeah. so they did re-redistricting. Tom DeLay did re-redistricting in 2003. Uh, so we absolutely need to get this done. Yeah, we're fortunate in Vermont. We don't have a redistricting uh, problem. Yeah. <laughs> My district it looks a little bit like the map of Vermont. In fact, it <laughs> You've is, got the it whole is, stage. It is the map of Vermont. But you know, that question uh, is, is really right on. If we pass, if we're able to pass this legislation, it applies to the state. So whatever they may have passed in Georgia or in Texas, the federal law would prevail um, as to these federal elections. So there would be a basis for immediate relief in court. Now, you know, we have to deal with a, 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 a court, the courts that are, are returning, returning against us. I mean, that's a burden, but there would be a legal basis uh, for the enforceability of the uh, HR1 provisions or the John Lewis uh, provisions. So it's really, really essential right. that we get this passed. I've got a question here um, from Adrian specifically for Congressman Castro. And uh, they're asking, are the Texas Democrats, what they're doing, will it work? Did it work when he did it in 2003? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. You know, in 2003, what we were facing when we left, uh, we left Ardmore, Oklahoma for four days, the state reps did. And then in the second special session, the state senators left for 34 days. And we were able to hold off that uh, re redistricting for a few months, uh, but ultimately the Republicans passed those maps and that litigation ended up in court for years and years, and, you know, literally for eight, nine years uh, after those maps were, were drawn. Same thing in the next decade, right? Um, and so the difference between 2003 when I left the state as a state rep and 2020 is that in, in 2021 is that in 2021, you now have a Democratic president, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic House of Representatives here in Washington that can pass legislation to address the problem. Right. And so what the state reps from Texas are doing can actually be successful as part of the chorus of voices and really in many ways taking the lead for the country in urging our Democratic senators uh, again to carve out an exception to the filibuster 
to protect people's voting rights. So you ask the question, can it work? It can absolutely work. It can absolutely be effective. Uh, as Democrats, we're in control of the White House and the Congress right now. So we can get this done. You know, by the way, I did notice, uh, you know, Joe Manchin, uh, who is a conservative Democrat, but um, uh, and has con expressed concern about the filibuster, uh, two things. One, I thought he did indicate some openness to what Harbo. Uh, and number two, he put forward his own voting rights uh, bill that contains you know, several right. provisions that are quite important in HR1. And uh, if we need any higher validation, uh, it was really endorsed by Stacey Abrams. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on, uh, on Stacey Abrams endorsing uh, some of the suggestions Manchin was making uh, about a voting rights bill that would incorporate so many of the provisions of HR1. Yeah, well, I think for, I think for Stacey, who's done incredible work on voting rights, one of the leaders in the country on this, uh, I think she recognized that it was a necessary and reasonable compromise given the dynamics of the United States Senate, given the fact that we have a slim majority when you add the vice president's vote. Um, and yet what you mm -hmm. saw right away was that when she endorsed it, you had a Republican press conference where they all jumped on it and said, oh, this is no longer the Joe Manchin proposal. This is the Stacey Abrams proposal. It's as if they were looking for really any reason, any reason. to say, hey, even this, even this that a conservative Democrat like Joe Manchin has proposed is unacceptable. And it makes you wonder then, is there anything that's acceptable to them that would protect people's voting rights? Uh, and, and, and I, I gotta think at this point, the answer is no. And that's why it's imperative that folks like Joe Manchin and, and Kirsten Cinema and others, um, you know, get on board with uh, making acceptance of the filibuster for, to protect voting rights. You know, one of the things that's so different here, uh, Joaquin, from when I served in the state senate in Vermont, uh, we had really contested elections. I served in the minority. I served in the majority. But when the elections were over, everybody understood they had an obligation to try to do things that were beneficial to Vermont. Uh, that's not the that's not the MO of uh, Senator McConnell. Right. Remember when uh, President Biden was first elected, Senator McConnell said himself, his job, as he saw it, was to make Obama a one-term president. And he had an insight uh, that unfortunately turned out to be true, that if he could throw sand in the gears uh, and do everything possible to uh, stop things from happening, uh, the party in power would get blamed for it, even though he was the one who caused it. And we've got some colleagues now that are saying that uh, constantly. I mean, uh, Chip Roy, I think that from- Yeah, Texas that's right. Uh, Chip's in says, my neighboring district of mine, yeah. yeah. He, said, he says chaos, he wants chaos, chaos, right. chaos. So, and then people throw their hands up, uh, which by the way, is another reason sometimes people decide, hey, it's not worth it to vote because they see that spectacle. Yeah, so you're right. So important. What it does, I think it, it adds to people's frustration with politics generally. Yeah. And they tend to disengage at that point. But it is interesting psychologically that even though the other side is doing everything they can to obstruct and create chaos, uh, you know, sometimes even your voters, if you don't get something right. done, they hold it against you. Even though it's you know, maybe the, the opposition that's preventing you from doing it, they hold it against you. And so understanding that, that's why it's important that we get these things done, that we get, that we protect voting rights, that we get infrastructure done, that we get immigration done, that we deliver on the things that, that we have promised in campaigns for years. And I'm feeling pretty good about our unit to that principle that you just said. I mean, yeah, know. I think I think the overwhelming majority of Democrats uh, believe that. Uh, I'm hoping that by the end, 100% of Democrats in the House and the Senate will, uh, you know, will, will believe that that's the best path for us. Um, going into 2022, but most of all, because it's the right thing to do for the American people. Right. I've got a question here uh, for Congressman Welch. Um, this is from Karen. Uh, what can Vermonters do to advocate for voting rights when our delegation is already working so hard to pass HR1? How do we help other states like Texas? Well, um, I think there's a number of things. First of all, I think it's good for everybody to check in with any of the senators who are on the fence. Uh, but actually, the Democratic senators are not on the fence. I don't think there's anybody uh, right. on the Democratic side. Uh, so you can encourage particularly people like Senator Manchin and, and Senator Sinema. 
Uh, the other thing, and really this is grassroots, the more you talk about this to your friends, even if it's friends that uh, are, you think, already on board, uh, you use a nice word, there's a chorus that's gotta, it's got to rise up here that uh, really uh, is going to make an impact ultimately on what our ability to maintain the vote. Uh, volunteer or donate. Uh, and there's a number of organizations. And uh, Natalie, you can put some of these up on the screen. But you know, somebody like Stacey Abrams and the work that she did, it probably made the difference in those two Senate races. And that oh, made the difference in us having 50 uh, senators with, uh, with, right. with the vice president casting the tie-breaking vote, I think. Yeah, oh no, no, yeah. her work and the work of the people in Georgia really helped save us. Yeah, so it, you've got Texas right to vote, which is a good, maybe you can vouch for that, but that's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's a good place where people might make contributions. Um, and the Black Voters Matter is doing tremendous work, Texas Civil Rights Project, uh, People First, uh, Fair Fight, the New Georgia, pro, uh, the New Georgia project. So, uh, Natalie, maybe you can put some of those um, on the screen where, if people want to contribute, uh, they have places where they can do that. Yeah, I'm going to put all of these organizations in the chat box so that when you guys are done uh, here, you guys can take a look and volunteer or donate if you can. Um, but right now, we're going to ask a couple more questions. Um, here's a question from Jeb, and Jeb is asking a question that a couple of folks have asked, uh, which is centering around the overturning of election results. Um, if we don't pass the For the People Act this summer and uh, the maps get redrawn, it seems like we might lose the midterms in 2022, and states will be able to override election results in 2024, no matter who the people vote for. Is this something we need to be concerned about? So maybe both of you guys can do some background explaining what that issue is, because I'm not sure everyone um, knows about that problem. Well, I'll start Please. and go to Joaquin, but one of the most, two of the most radical provisions I've heard about are letting partisans be poll watchers. And Joaquin talked about that earlier. So it literally could be uh, the Trump partisans or the Proud Boys, and they would be looking over your shoulder almost uh, when you're voting. It would be some real intimidation. We've never, ever had that. And that obviously would have a real impact. But a second thing that is truly astonishing, you're seeing this being fought out in Georgia, is the legislature basically wants to strip the Secretary of State of the responsibility the Secretary of State has for the elections, and then delegate that to a panel that's either appointed by a partisan legislature or give that authority to the legislature itself. So what it would in effect mean is that whatever the vote count was, a partisan legislature could have its own capacity to overturn that election and elect the person they preferred. And that's essentially what was the effort that was being done here in Washington uh, with the effort to de not certify President Biden, okay? That, that would be long, ga the game plan there was to not certify him and then try to have Congress vote to uh, uh, change the outcome. Well, and I think there's concern that in the midterms, yeah. if you lose the midterms as Democrats, if you lose the Senate, if you lose the House, and Joe Biden gets reelected, for example, in 2024, that you get to January of 2025, right. and now with a Republican Congress, they refuse to certify the election and they want to vote to install a Republican president. I mean, that's like the worst nightmare, you know, bottom of the barrel fear. But look, you but know, they're for it. Well, yeah, well, 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 well that's the that, thing. Right? It, it's headed in the craziness is headed in that direction. And, you know, it's one of those things where you want to be able to just dismiss it and think, well, right. it's just a conspiracy and come on, they're not actually going to do that. But when you have an attempted coup, at the United States Capitol, and then the same night, you have a, you know, a lot of Republicans vote not to certify the election. 139. Uh, that's right. I mean, the majority of Republicans vote not to certify the election, and the crazy just keeps getting crazier. You have to acknowledge that that is a concern, that it's on your radar, uh, and, and that's a very, you know, in many ways, shocking and sad thing to say. But it's also something, unfortunately, that's got to that's got to be on our radar. Yeah, and you know, 
attacking the vote has been used before to maintain power. It's what happened, you know, after the Civil War, we had reconstruction and we had a period in this history where African Americans, formerly enslaved people, were allowed to vote. And there was an enormous uh, uh, a civic uprising and flowering uh, among, among formerly enslaved people. Uh, people went to Congress. Uh, they were in state legislatures. Uh, they were creating civic organizations. And then there was the reaction to that. And the backlash, yeah. The, back, well, the backlash and then the deal with, uh, in, the, in the hayes Tillman election. Sure. Where the federal troops that were providing some guarantee of protection, some guarantee because there was still an awful lot of violence left. And the deal was that in exchange for uh, uh, federal troops leaving and essentially abandoning reconstruction, uh, the, the uh, uh, Hayes was accepted as the president. Uh, and then what happened, Jim Crow, that's when the, uh, uh, everything was done to stop uh, African-Americans from voting. There was everything from uh, tests, like how many jelly beans are in this jar, literacy tests uh, that, uh, that, that were administered to, to, to black voters, but not to white voters, uh, and violence, lynching. I mean, everything that was done Right. that uh, finally we started to reverse after uh, the 1965 civil rights law. But th that was all about stopping people from voting. And now those efforts to use the legislative power in a state to restrict access to voting and supposedly would apply to everybody. Well, of course it doesn't because there's disparate impacts. That's what the whole Civil Rights Act acknowledged. You can set something up that quote is neutral, but really isn't. Uh, Anyway, you have any thoughts on that? No, I think you, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. And in many ways, it's why people think that we're actually taking a step backward uh, rather than continuing to move forward with all this incredible voter suppression, with laws that, that on their face can seem neutral, but at the same time, these conservative Republicans know exactly who's being impacted most, uh, who's being affected, who's being denied their rights. Uh, and we got to fight back against it. I've got a couple questions here asking if uh, there's any movement to uh, make election day a federal holiday, or is that something that you can do? Yeah, yeah, I believe that's included I, in there. I think it's an HR one. I know it's in the mansion proposal uh, to make it a holiday. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm going to speak for myself. I actually think the vote by mail uh, uh, is, is even more important than it being a holiday. Because, I mean, look what we saw in Vermont where there was immense uh, uh, vote by mail. People really took advantage of it. They had time to decide when and how to vote. Uh, they could do it at their convenience and it worked. And, uh, you know, the holiday, I think uh, uh, I'd be for it, uh, but I actually think the mail and the mail option is really important or having the drop box sure. or have, being able to have your vote picked up. Uh, these sure. things that make it convenient. Uh, are and, and, you know, and you, it's interesting you mentioned that because in Texas, they were trying to limit the number of drop boxes right. that a county could have. And if you were trying to leave your, your mail ballot at a drop box, you'd have to get it certified by the election clerk first. Yeah, and explain and, a yeah. drop box. We don't have those so much in Vermont. But, and so but, it's a but place where- secure, right? The yeah, that's right. Are not secure. So yeah. just explain that to- You know, it's, it's, it's a it's secure a way to- for you to leave your ballot somewhere, knowing that you've placed it in a, in a secure place where it's going to be received and, and taken by the election administrator. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the efforts was to limit that number in some counties just to one place for the whole county. Uh, well, you can imagine how cumbersome that is for many folks. Uh, and so we, you know, we've been fighting this now for some time. Got a couple more uh, questions here, just about getting involved, and um, you know, one of them is from Anita, who's expressing a lot of frustration because it sounds like um, she has been volunteering and working really hard on this issue, and. Uh, Patricia also is feeling such a sense of urgency related to this legislation. How do we light a fire under other folks? And also uh, we have Vermont's own Lieutenant Governor, Molly Gray has written in welcoming Congressman Castro virtually to Vermont and saying, how can we as Vermonters, including attorneys and advocates 
get involved in the fight to protect voting rights uh, and prevent voter suppression. So people need to get fired up, folks. <laughs> well, first, if you have any relatives in Texas uh, or in other states where this is where where you see voting rights under assault, please reach out to them and ask them to to speak up, to be part of that chorus of voices uh, that's speaking to state leaders and legislators and asking them to stop this voter suppression. Uh, and, and then just mobilizing, as Peter mentioned earlier, helping the groups that are organizing and taking on this fight and reaching out to the policymakers, the decision makers in Congress who are, we're, look, again, as Democrats, we have the numbers, the people that we need to make sure that we create an exception to the filibuster. We pass HR1, we pass HR4. We have the power to do that in this term and stop a lot of these bad bills from, from taking effect. Yeah, and you know, Anita, I know uh, you and I uh, correspond a lot and sometimes talk on the phone, but you speak for a lot of people where if you're in Vermont and you are lobbying Patrick, Bernie, or me, it's kind of frustrating because <laughs> we already, we agree with you. Uh, and we've got to change minds of some folks like Ted Cruz. Uh, and that's no, not we... going to happen. <laughs> I think we need a new senator. I don't know, Joaquin. But feel free to mind. try, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I do want to say this, because when we're facing something where we know it's really wrong, and we're looking for some way to affect it, and, you know, in Vermont, we've got people who support what we all share, that access to voting. You, we can't let ourselves get discouraged because that uh, works uh, for the folks that yeah. uh, no, really are fighting right. against us. And it's hard sometimes not to get down it's, and get discouraged it, about it. It's, it's really hard. And, and I always think that, uh, you know, if you have relatives in Texas, do that. If you can contribute, do that. Uh, but it's really important just in our own communities, wherever you live, uh, to engage with other Vermonters, whether they agree with you or they don't, uh, and, and talk about it and get the conversation going and find some things you can do by getting involved locally to create a sense of community. You know, one of the things that really sustains me, why can't I be interested in your thoughts about it? In Vermont, people a lot of times will ask me, how do you do it down there? Because they see the spectacle of what we're dealing with here. Oh, sure. Yeah. But when I go home and I see Vermonters working together on concrete things and where they, like, we get some money to you know, make better, uh, safer uh, intersections. Well, that means when parents are driving their kids to school, kids are safer. Yeah. And whether they the, those parents voted for Trump or voted for uh, a Biden, the kids are safer. That's a good thing. And, you know, in Vermont, in, in your community, you have a way, you have a capacity to do concrete things that are beneficial, even if they're somewhat indirect to uh, uh, what we're talking about now. And I think that's really worthwhile. Well, yeah, and I think that should be the focus of government is uh, doing impactful, meaningful things for people in their lives, whether it's an in infrastructure in the streets and roads or in healthcare or their children's schools colleges and universities, all those things, rather than spending so much time figuring out how to keep people from voting. Yeah. You know, the big problem in our country is not that people vote too often, it's that not enough people actually go vote. Yeah, uh, or, or, right. or spending a lot of time, you know, drawing these weird shapes on maps and gerrymandering. Um, but you know, you're right, and that's one reason that I'm excited about this transfer, this infrastructure bill yeah, that we've too. been working right. on, because yeah. I think that's gonna be so beneficial to so many different communities across the country. I've got one um, last question here that feels like a good one to end on, and then you guys can um, sum up. Um, this is again from uh, Adrian. We have, how do you feel like, and this seems like what you guys were just talking about, how do we feel like we should talk about this issue so we don't demotivate people and make them feel like their vote actually won't count or they get so frustrated they stay home in 2022. Thanks so much for this conversation. Well, you know, again, when, 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 when you feel powerless, it's very debilitating. And we, I can't do much to affect Ted Cruz. And even Joaquin Castro, who's one of well, the- Neither can I, actually. Well, that's <laughs> gonna say, you're, you're one of the most effective members of Congress. You've had an extraordinary <laughs> career. And I'm not sure even you can affect Ted Cruz. You know what I mean? So it's it's frustrating. 
because you've got to make some judgments about where you can put your time. But on the other hand, uh, getting involved locally where you are and doing what you can. And it's everything from if you do have a relative in Texas, do that. If you can make a modest contribution to uh, folks who are, say, in Georgia, like Stacey Abrams or uh, the work you're doing, that you folks in Texas are doing about sure. work, that's a good thing to do. But I always come back to somehow, some way, you've got to have confidence that by being a good person in your neighborhood, by contributing where you are, somehow that's going to have a ripple impact uh, and create uh, good things down the line, even if you can't see them. But somehow, some way, even if you're discouraged. And by the way, it's scary for Joaquin, right? Because I mentioned we were here. And, you know, in many ways, it was heartbreaking for me to see some of my Republican colleagues who I've I've respected a lot vote to decertify because that's not having an argument with them about what's the right tax policy or the healthcare policy of prescription drugs. I mean, that, that's a norm where I thought that all of us understood that the outcome of the election, we all validated that that was not our call. So it was, it, it, it was, it was a sad feeling for me and still is. But we've each got to get up each day and do everything that we can and do it locally, do it with the people in your school board do it to encourage a younger person to get involved. So I don't know about yeah, you. I mean, thoughts. I mean, you know, yeah. you grew up on the west side of San Antonio. I mean, no silver yeah. spoon. And, you know, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. You, your family's accomplished. Oh, your you. brother ran for president and served in the, uh, the cabinet. Uh, I mean, you know, you're an example of what can be done uh, when, how in the world did you do that? No, yeah, seriously. No, you know, and I, I grew up with a family that was very involved in grassroots politics, very much felt like outsiders to the system uh, in a community that oftentimes felt powerless. And I would ask people to believe, most of all, to believe that your voice and that your commitment can actually make a difference. And, and it absolutely can. Like I said, on this particular thing, as Democrats, we're in a position to fight off a lot of these pernicious voting rights uh, uh, suppression tactics. And so please don't give up and stay in there and fight and your voice will make a difference in the end, I believe. Yeah. But you know, call your senators, uh, volunteer, uh, tell your friends about this, ask them to get involved, just keep the conversation going. Great. Well, thank you both so much. I think that uh, we're about out of time. And so like Congressman Welch said, you've got your action items. And I put this in all the groups that they mentioned in the chat. So you can definitely head there. And we'll send an email out to everyone with those links and with some steps that you can take. Um, and Secretary of State Condos from Vermont uh, saying that Representative Castro, when you come to Vermont, stop by my office bring Congressman Welch for a cup of coffee and um, he's done coffee. some great work. So thanks, Secretary Contos. We're going to do better. We're going to give you Ben and Jerry's and a good yeah. craft beer. Okay? And Peter's been and after maple me. maple syrup. Well, I've never, I, I confess, and y'all will have to forgive me that I have never been to Vermont. And I need oh, to go visit. Yeah. I've been to, to <laughs> Massachusetts, obviously. I went to school there. I've been to Maine. I've been to New Hampshire. I've been all around. But I need to go to Vermont, and I promise I will get there. Yeah, we'll look forward to it. And uh, Secretary Condos, I just want to end by saying thank you for the tremendous work you did. And uh, he was the head of the National Secretary of State mm. organization. Uh, it was just a stalwart. Uh, thank you for all your for, work. For access to voting. So th thank you all, everybody.